Chapter Twenty One of the Adventures of Odysseus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Adventures of Odysseus and the Tale of Troy, by Park Colum. Part Two, Chapter Six. When the sun sank and darkness came on, my men went to lie by the hawsers of the ship. Then Circe the Enchantress took my hand and making me sit down by her, told me of the voyage that was before us. "'To the sirens first you shall come,' said she, "'to the sirens, who sit in their field of flowers and bewitch all men who come near them. He who comes near the sirens without knowing their ways, and hears the sounds of their voices, never again shall that man see wife or child, or have joy of his homecoming.' All round where the sirens sit are great heaps of the bones of men. But I will tell thee, Odysseus, how thou mayest pass them. When thou comest near, put wax over the ears of thy company, lest any of them hear the sirens' song. But if thou thyself art minded to hear, let thy company bind thee hand and foot to the mast. And if thou shalt beseech them to loose thee, they must bind thee with tighter bonds. When thy companions have driven the ship past where the sirens sing, thou canst be unbound. Past where the sirens sit there is a dangerous place indeed. On one side there are great rocks which the gods call the rocks wandering. No ship ever escapes that goes that way. And round these rocks the planks of ships and the bodies of men are tossed by the waves of the sea and storms of fire. One ship only ever passed that way. Jason's ship, the Argo, and that ship would have been broken on the rocks if Hera the goddess had not helped it to pass, because of her love for the hero Jason. On the other side of the rocks wandering are two peaks through which thou wilt have to take thy ship. One peak is smooth and sheer and goes up to the clouds of heaven. In the middle of it there is a cave, and that cave is the den of a monster named Scylla. This monster has six necks, and on each neck there is a hideous head. She holds her heads over the gulf, seeking for prey and yelping horribly. No ship has ever passed that way without Scylla seizing and carrying off in each mouth of her six heads the body of a man. The other peak is near. Thou couldst send an arrow across to it from Scylla's den. Out of the peak a fig-tree grows, and below that fig-tree Charybdis has her den. She sits there sucking down the water and spouting it forth. Mayst thou not be near when she sucks the water down, for then nothing could save thee. Keep nearer to Scylla's than to Charybdis's rock. It is better to lose six of your company than to lose thy ship and all thy company. Keep near Scylla's rock and drive right on. If thou shouldst win past the deadly rocks guarded by Scylla and Charybdis, Thou wilt come to the island of Thrinacia. There the cattle of the sun graze with immortal nymphs to guard them. If thou comest to that island, do no hurt to those herds. If thou dost hurt to them, I foresee ruin for thy ship and thy men, even though thou thyself shouldst escape. So Circe spoke to me, and having told me such things, she took her way up the island. Then I went to the ship and roused my men. Speedily they went aboard, and having taken their seats upon the benches, struck the water with their oars. Then the sails were hoisted and a breeze came and we sailed away from the isle of Circe, the enchantress. I told my companions what Circe had told me about the sirens in their field of flowers. I took a great piece of wax and broke it and kneaded it until it was soft. Then I covered the ears of my men, and they bowed me upright to the mast of the ship. The wind dropped and the sea became calm, as though a god had stilled the waters. My company took their oars and pulled away. When the ship was within a man's shout from the land we had come near, the sirens espied us and raised their song. "'Come hither, come hither, O Odysseus,' the sirens sang. "'Stay thy bark and listen to our song. None hath ever gone this way in his ship until he hath heard from our own lips the voice sweet as honeycomb, and hath joy of it, and gone on his way a wiser man. We know all things, all the travail the Greeks had in the wars of Troy, 
and we know all that hereafter shall be upon the earth. Odysseus, Odysseus, come to our field of flowers, and hear the song that we shall sing to thee. My heart was mad to listen to the sirens. I nodded my head to the company, commanding them to unloose me, but they bound me tighter, and bent to their oars and rowed on. When we had gone past the place of the sirens, the men took the wax from off their ears and loosed me from the mast. But no sooner had we passed the island than I saw smoke arising and heard the roaring of the sea. My company threw down their oars in terror. I went amongst them to hearten them, and I made them remember how my device we had escaped from the cave of the Cyclops. I told them nothing of the monster Scylla, lest the fear of her should break their hearts. And now we began to drive through that narrow strait. On one side was Scylla and the other Charybdis. Fear gripped the men when they saw Charybdis gulping down the sea. But as we drove by the monster Scylla seized six of my company, the hardiest of the men who were with me. As they were lifted up in the mouths of her six heads they called to me in their agony, but I could do nothing to aid them. They were carried up to be devoured in the monster's den. Of all the sights I have seen on the ways of the water, that sight was the most pitiful. Having passed the rocks of Scylla and Charybdis we came to the island of Thrinacia. While we were yet on the ship I heard the lowing of the cattle of the sun. I spoke to my company and told them that we should drive past that island and not venture to go upon it. The hearts of my men were broken within them at that sentence, and Eurylochus answered me, speaking sadly. It is easy for thee, O Odysseus, to speak like that, for thou art never weary, and thou hast strength beyond measure. But is thy heart too of iron, that thou wilt not suffer thy companions to set foot upon shore, where they may rest themselves from the sea, and prepare their supper at their ease? So Eurylochus spoke, and the rest of the company joined in what he said. Their force was greater than mine. Then said I, Swear to me a mighty oath, one and all of you, that if we go upon this island none of you will slay the cattle out of any herd. They swore the oath that I gave them. We brought our ship to a harbour, and landed near a spring of fresh water, and the men got their supper ready. Having eaten their supper they fell to weeping, for they thought upon their comrades that Scylla had devoured. Then they slept. The dawn came, but we found that we could not take our ship out of the harbour, for the north wind and the east wind blew a hurricane. So we stayed upon the island, and the days and weeks went by. When the corn we had brought in the ship was all eaten, the men went through the island fishing and hunting. Little they got to stay their hunger. One day, while I slept, Eurylochus gave the men a most evil counsel. Every death, he said, is hateful to man, but death by hunger is far the worst. Rather than die of hunger, let us drive off the best cattle from the herds of the sun. Then, if the gods would wreck us on the sea for deceit, let them do it. I would rather perish on the waves than die in the pangs of hunger." So he spoke, and the rest of the men approved of what he said. They slaughtered them and roasted their flesh. It was then that I awakened from my sleep. As I came down to the ship the smell of the roasting flesh came to me. Then I knew that a terrible deed had been committed, and that a dreadful thing would befall all of us. For six days my company feasted on the best of the cattle. On the seventh day the wind ceased to blow. Then we went to the ship and set up the mast and the sails and fared out again on the deep. But having left that island, no other land appeared, only sky and sea were to be seen. A cloud stayed always above our ship, and beneath that cloud the sea was darkened. The west wind came in a rush, and the mast broke, and in breaking struck off the head of the pilot and he fell straight down into the sea. A thunderbolt struck the ship, and the men were swept from the deck. Never a man of my company did I see again. The west wind ceased to blow, but the south wind came and it drove the ship back on its course. It rushed towards the terrible rocks of Scylla and Charybdis. All night long was I borne on, and at the rising of the sun I found myself near Charybdis. My ship was sucked down but I caught the branches of the fig-tree that grew out of the rock and hung to it like a bat. There I stayed until the timbers of my ship were cast up again by Charybdis. 
I dropped down on them. Sitting on the boards I rode with my hands and passed the rock of Scylla without the monster seeing me. Then for nine days I was borne along by the waves, and on the tenth day I came to Ogygia, where the nymph Calypso dwells. She took me to her dwelling and treated me kindly. But why tell the remainder of my toils? To thee, O king, and to thy noble wife I told how I came from Calypso's island, and I am not one to repeat a plain-told tale. End of section 21